So a very good afternoon. My name is John Glover, and I'm on the uh, board of Sid Washington, and I lead the uh, program committee. And I'm very pleased to in, have all of you here today, and, and ex would like to extend my thanks to the uh, panelists who've agreed to speak today on this extremely interesting topic. I'm a, those of you who know me, I'm a very big fan of how the private sector is involved in contributing and playing a major role in delivering development. And I think this is going to be an extremely interesting panel, also in light of what we heard over lunch, of how the private sector can be engaged in new, different, and extremely valuable contributions to enhancing development. And with that, I'd like to hand over just actually to Kathy Kaufman, who comes to us from OPIC. And she's going to serve as the moderator. And we're basically handing off the next one. And she'll just probably go down the line. But anyway, I'd like to thank you. I think this is going to be a great, great panel. And I look forward to hearing how it plays out. Thank you both. Great, thank you, John. Can, can you all hear me? Microphone is on, great. Um, so yes, welcome to the panel on private sector contributions to development, which will in fact be the most exciting panel here at the conference, completely unbiased opinion. I know that because our icon is the dollar symbol, so I thought this room would maybe be overflowing, so we'll see how we go as, it, as the conversation continues. Um, I am delighted by the diversity and the power of the panel that we have assembled here. Global leaders from healthcare to food to oil and gas, so quite a lot to cover. Um, and I think we have just about an hour, so we'll get right into it. Um, what I'll do is quickly introduce myself and tell you a little bit about my institution and ask the panelists to follow that model. And specifically, when I do hand it off, to speak to the topic of this, which might be lessons learned in what you're doing in development and how that has shaped new models going forward. Um, so, so I'll be brief, and I would like you to be extended, okay? Because I represent the uh, public sector. I work at a place called Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Has anyone ever heard of that? Oh my gosh, this is the most uh, informed place I have ever had the opportunity to speak. People usually think I work for an oil cartel. Um, so OPIC is our development finance institution. We make investments ranging from 400,000 to 250 million to support private sector growth in emerging markets. So we've been doing development work uh, since 1971, and we've been doing it all with the private sector and all while returning about 300 million to the US Treasury each year. Having said that, we actually are deploying a new model um, for the first time in quite a long time, and that new model includes a gender lens. So I'm just gonna brag about that for two minutes because that's my baby and what I work on at OPIC. And um, we've branded that gender lens uh, 2X to represent the multiplier effect of investing in women and the chromosome. And um, it has two components. The first is we're committing to mobilize a billion dollars to provide women with access to capital, jobs, skills, services, and products in emerging markets. That commitment means that we, OPIC, will put 350 million in, and we'll call on our private sector partners to come up and mobilize the remainder to get us to a billion because every dollar OPIC puts in, we, we typically catalyze three private sector dollars. So that's why I guess I made sense to moderate this panel because we're so dependent on the private sector and the good work that they're doing. The other aspect of 2X is applying a gender lens to all of OPIC's investments. So we deploy about $4 billion every year and of the sectors of investment range from um, microfinance, which has a very obvious and direct impact on women, to large-scale utility and power generation and distribution, which actually has an incredible effect on women because guess what? Women are half of your consumers, um, but it's not as evident when you're underwriting a transaction and you actually can have a lot of influence. So we're trying to make sure that with every dollar we invest, no matter what type of investment, we're doing our part for gender equitable change. So that's a little bit about OPIC and a new model that we're deploying and that we're confident will give us better financial returns and better development outcomes. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Yasmin and ask uh, for your contributions. Thank you, Katie. My name is Yasmin Ruwai. I am an Associate Director in Global Health Policy at EMD Sorono, which is the healthcare business of Mark KGA Darmstadt, Germany. 
My focus day to day is primarily helping our internal and working with our external partners on establishing good frameworks for public private partnerships in order to advance health outcomes around the world. A little bit about my company. Uh, Merck KGA Darmstadt Germany is a 350 year old science and technology company in healthcare, life sciences, and performance materials. We operate in the United States as EMD Serono, Millipore Sigma, and EMD, Mil EMD Performance Materials, respectively. Lots of words there. <laughs> Um, and once working with our external partners, one thing that we realized is that we are sitting on a lot of knowledge on diseases, and a lot of these partners don't necessarily know about how some diseases disproportionately affect women, such as multiple sclerosis or thyroid disease. So what we did was really work with USG um, and the Philippines government under the auspices of APAC to research this. And what we're, what we're finding, and I, I think a lot of us are familiar with these, is that about 65% of women uh, are dying because of non-communicable diseases, which is a staggering number, um, and largely preventable. Things like heart disease, things like cancer, things that we can all work together um, to find solutions on. And, and what happens is that some of the women are, are afflicted with these diseases in their economic prime, and so they can't um, contribute to the economy, they can't contribute to their families. Um, and so we were looking at this and found that about 865 will, million women around the world don't fully participate in the economy uh, because of preventable diseases. And what is the economic outcome to this? If women and men participated in the economy to the, at the same level, we could add about $27 trillion to the GDP. So, the reason why we're working on this is clear and why the partners are working on it as well. So we got together um, and looked at this and found a lot of this research and, and we decided to launch a public-private partnership called Healthy Women, Healthy Economies that looks at uh, policy levers that ec ec economies, countries, private sector can, can use to improve and remove women's health barriers so they can join, thrive, and rise in the workplace. And, and what I found is, while working on this on this partnership, and, and what our partners have found is that as we're working together, we find common solutions and win-wins to really advance development and international de development and uh, health outcomes for, for women and for, by, by extension, their families and their communities. Thank you so much, Yasmin. I just wanted to add one thing. I love the statistic that you threw out about um, increasing women's labor force participation to help bolster economies. And I just wanted to add to it, um, from the development side, um, when women earn a competitive income, they spend 90% of it on their families, on their aging parents' health care, and their child's education. And by comparison, men spend between 30 and 40%. So if we want to be efficient in our development work and have the uh, most uh, high impact as possible. It makes all the sense in the world to focus some of our effort on, on women. So it's that dual stool of um, economic prosperity and global stability that we're going to realize um, from this gender uh, focus. So very interesting. Thank you so much. Meredith, would you mind telling us about Land Lakes? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is uh, Meredith Saggers. I'm the head of our monitoring, evaluation, and learning department at Land Lakes International Development. Um, so Land Lake's story um, of how they got into development work may be a bit different than a lot of private sector organizations. Land Lakes actually started in 1921 as a small farmer-owned cooperative uh, selling dairy products, and their um, their vision was was working together for the greater good. And so over the last hundred or so years. Uh, Land Lakes has expanded. Uh, it's still a farmer-owned, member-owned cooperative, um, but it's expanded beyond the butter that I'm sure all of you guys know um, into other milk products, but also into uh, crop inputs with um, an acquisition of Winfield and into um, animal feed uh, with Purina. Um, so recently, in the past five years, Land Lakes has also started investing in Africa. Um, in Kenya, they invested in a company um, 
a company called Bidco that's in animal feed, and in South Africa, a company called Villa, which is in crop inputs, um, and has a Villa Academy, which is um, which does training. So, in 1981. Um, they got into development, and it started as uh, actually a couple of failed international ventures to try to get their product um, into the international community. But what they realized was that you know, the values of the organization are still the same as back in, in 1921. Actually, um, the, the mission now is feeding human pro progress, and they do that through um, their their work with uh, really valuing their customers, uh, lots of research, um, and, and making sure that we make the best products that we can for, for our customers. Um, so the farmer owners really realized that they have a lot to contribute to, the, to international development and to agricultural development because they have so much knowledge of what it takes to be a dairy farmer or a crop farmer. Um, so, so was born the International Development Division. Um, and so over the past 40 years, the International Development Division has um, implemented over 300 pro projects in about 80 countries. Um, and now we're a nonprofit in our own right, um, but we're still closely affiliated with uh, the corporation with Land O'Lakes, Land O'Lakes Incorporated. Um, and so I, We'll uh, tell you a bit about what we do and a bit how we leverage uh, the private sector corporation. Um, so we work mainly in dairy, livestock, and crops, and it is not surprising that, that those are the focus areas of Land O'Lakes, the, the corporation. Um, we try to leverage Land O'Lakes, Inc. and their technologies, research, um, and expertise as much as we can in our development work. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of how we leverage Land O'Lakes, Inc. Um, one, um, and primarily, it's the expertise. So we do this in a number of ways. Um, for example, I'll just give you a, a few examples from recent projects that we've done. We have a project in, in Mozambique that was looking at uh, trying to figure out how to use pigeon peas um, when the market to sell to India, the, the price dropped. Um, so we utilized a, um, a expert from Purina in animal feed to think about how, how can we do a formulation with pigeon peas that will use local ingredients that you can sell it as a, um, you know, as an animal feed product. Um, other examples, uh, we, we work with the Land O'Lakes quality assurance team a lot. Um, who better to work with other co international companies about how to maintain quality of their goods than you know, a Fortune 500, $15 billion company. Um, <coughs> you know, and these staff are doing it on a daily basis for, for Land O'Lakes. Um, Land O'Lakes also has this um, talent acceleration program, so it's um, you know, middle level, uh, low level staff that they do rotations across the organization, and one rotation is in uh, the nonprofit international development for some staff. They will go on a six month rotation to, um, to international developments projects in other countries. Um, so this are, those are just a few examples of how we leverage uh, the, the corporate expertise. Um, and just one specific thing that's actually happening right now, I'm sure um, some of you guys, if you're in agriculture, know about uh, the fall armyworm and um, how it's now come to Africa um, in early 2017. It used to just be endemic to South America. And it feeds on um, mostly maize, but other crops as well. Um, and maize is such a huge part of um, food security uh, in Africa. And so there's been a lot, of done, a lot done on mitigating the impact of the fall armyworm. Um, but our initiative in, in South Africa, Villa and Villa Academy, has, has gotten very involved, um, especially in our projects that are, are fairly, fairly affected by the fall army worm. So they've done some uh, assessments in Mozambique and Malawi to understand the prevalence. 
Uh, they st they've done some trainings of our projects. Um, they're actually currently, uh, this week, doing a training at Villa Academy in South Africa for about 100 seed organizations um, around Africa to really talk about the fall, fall army worm issue. Um, Land O'Lakes also invested in, uh, with USAID in a uh, fall army worm digital prize, so looking for solutions, uh, t technological solutions to fall, fall army worms, and they're giving four to six prizes, and I think it's in the next few months. So that's just a bit about um, what Land O'Lakes does, and, and Land O'Lakes International Development as a nonprofit is in a very unique position because we can leverage this expertise um, that is just not normally able to, to really consult on these projects. Um, that is just amazing that Land O'Lakes is doing quite so much. I was not even aware there was a fall army worm, so thank you for bringing <laughs> that to our attention. But really, I just to step back and look at this, the, the new models for private sector in, the, in development, it strikes me that there is almost a new model of the public sector and the private sector acknowledging each other. Um, I guess it goes without saying that the private sector is the one creating nine out of 10 jobs in these emerging markets and has this expertise that you're talking about and doing amazing work. And I'm not sure they always get the credit that, that they deserve. And I'm new to this space, but it does seem that there was a previous divide between the private sector and the public sector and a little bit of distrust between them. And that seems to be falling apart, and there seems to be this new um, acceptance that in order to scale, we've <coughs> got to bring the private sector with the public sector and vice versa. So um, Land O'Lakes is a great example of that. Thank you so much. Um, can I turn it over to Joanne to tell us about Chevron? Sure, well, hello, everyone. It's great to be with you. Um, Sid is a very sophisticated, talented group, and I was looking at your board on what's the future of development, and I keep coming back to the fact that it's really talented people like you all. And, and you all, a lot of you have been partners with Chevron at, at various periods in time, so thank you for that. Um, interestingly, that your motto is feeding human progress. Chevron's motto is enabling human progress, mm -hmm. um, an energy company that's really committed to producing reliable, affordable energy and um, very committed to doing that in a socially and environmentally responsible way. Um, if Chevron had a middle name, it would probably be partnerships. One of our sort of standing statements that we make and have publicly sort of on our website and, everything, and everywhere else is that we strive to be a partner of choice. Um, the way Chevron operates, at, at every turn, partnerships have to be fundamental to getting anything done. So it's really part of the, the fabric of the company to work and collaborate together with others. Um, in the social investment space, Chevron's partnered with numerous um, development organizations, agencies, nonprofits. We're one of USAID's largest partner. We've had, uh, we've invested, co-invested over $130 million with, with USAID over the years, and we're one of the first companies to do that. Um, and there's some, some really interesting reasons why that's been such a complimentary partnership, and I can talk about that in a minute. Um, I thought I would just give you sort of a high-level overview of some of the principles that Chevron uses around partnerships. Um, uh, societies, healthy communities, strong societies are really fundamental to the success of the business. Um, the way Chevron operates, and everywhere outside, so we have very large operations in the United States. The U.S. is actually our largest growing operational area, interestingly enough, but we have other, other large operations in Australia, in Nigeria, Angola, Indonesia, Thailand, Bangladesh, around the world. Um, and inevitably, we are usually working with a host country government, a central government, but we're maybe operating in a community that's very far from the central government. So what happens in that community and how we engage with that community is equally important to how we engage with the central government and, and deal with contracts and negotiations. Um, so that means that being in that far flung of set of places, we have to be a little bit issue agnostic. Largely, Chevron's partnerships and social engagements fall into three big categories of health, economic development, and education. Um, we try to, so we, we know that it's necessary for impact that we partner with others because Chevron doesn't have the type of capabilities to implement deep programs in those, in all those areas. We can kind of manage and assess them, but fundamentally we need partners to help us do that. 
Um, one of the hallmarks of the way Chevron has engaged in partnerships, I think oftentimes we think that it's not about the outcome, it's about the process. And we take a very participatory approach to engaging and to deciding how funds are spent. And you'll see this in various projects around the world. But what we'll try to do is in looking at sort of an area where we may think we need a new social investment strategy or a new approach or we need to think, you know, we're sort of entering for the first time, we'll sit down with local leaders, with community members, um, we'll do surveys, we'll have sometimes third parties because people may not tell us the exact truth when we say, okay, so what do you want out of Chevron's partnership in your community, in your country? How, how do we think about this? Um, and from all of the data, we try to be very data driven, from all the data, from stakeholder surveys, from data about what are the driving trends or challenges in those communities to what is the country or the region's uh, development plan, we try to figure out what's, what's the right way to engage. And we've developed participatory governance models that have been quite successful. Um, sometimes I, I know that the projects are very important, but sometimes the decision making process, the fact that people feel heard and listened to, that, that stakeholder engagement is really critical to, to getting the kind of impact that Chevron is looking for from these projects, which is to have communities feel comfortable and feel like they have a voice in what you're doing in their area. Um, we do see changing expectations around partnerships. Fundamentally, I think that we, we have seen, within Chevron at least, we've seen pretty significant innovation over the past 10 to 15 years in how we think about partnerships going from sort of um, infrastructure investments or schools or hospitals to these more community uh, capability building approaches. And that, that has been the result of changing expectations. What we're seeing now is, is probably going to be in the realm of how your business is, is interacting with the community. There's always pressure from governments and from communities to hire locally, to source locally. You know, to think about what you're doing locally and Chevron's had a very big push to hire locally, about 95% of our employees work in their home country. Um, we've made a, you know, had a big significant push on local sourcing where we can and, and identifying areas where you can source locally. Some things you can't source locally. You've got quality and, and safety requirements that are always fundamental. Uh, but for any areas where you can source locally, it's, there's always an important effort to look at that. So those sort of business drivers and trends are really moving more into the social space, I think, than we've ever seen before. Then um, we've had an emphasis for quite a while on co-investing. So we don't just want to put up the funds and hope that it all works out. We want to find partners and co-invest. And that's, that's one area where USAID has come in. Um, and there's a lot of room for growth and change within USAID. And we're trying to look at some of the lessons that we've learned and think about how could we, how could we sort of modernize partnerships in the way we're working with a group like USAID. The things that have worked very well with USAID that are very complementary, it's a very large organization, very global. You have sort of policy direction from headquarters, but a lot of authority and uh, financial options at the mission level. And that's very much the way Chevron runs. We've got every individual business or country team has a budget, they have priorities, they know what they're doing. And so those two groups, the mission and the country team for Chevron will often work together to figure out what's gonna make the most sense and how they can work together. Um, we also have very complementary uh, procurement and um, procurement and sort of safety and security requirements. We got to make sure that everyone follows all the laws, all the rules, and USAID is always very good at that. And that's why a lot of your organizations have been partners as well. Um, you know, some of the U.S.-based NGOs and organizations are very, very good on all the compliance factors. That's a fundamentally important issue that that we're always going to look at with partners. I think another one of the trends that we've seen is that. Um, just with, as with a localization of a workforce, there's also a push for localization of your implementing partners. So trying to balance the need for U.S. style compliance with local NGOs and organizations and how you do that is, is become an increasing area of focus. And I think it probably is for many companies. Um, so those are some of the fundamentals that we've looked at and some of the ways we've been successful. Uh, we have partnerships of all kinds all around the world. I can talk more about them if anyone's interested. But I think that um, just, I, I can kind of close there, but just noting the fact that, you know, no one entity can do this by themselves. We are always going to rely on other, uh, other groups, other organizations, and other sets of expertise. But 
it can be very slow and very tough to get to a point where you, you decide together what you want to do. And I think that's one of the areas where it does take some patience. Chevron's a really big company with a lot of bureaucracy, just like the U.S. government. So sometimes our partners may get a little frustrated because it can take time to work through things. And um, that's, that's one of the lessons I've learned to try to figure out how we can navigate that a little more smoothly is an area that we'll always try to work on. But um, I think the area in looking to the future of how partnerships are working, there's a lot of opportunity around co-financing, you know, impact investing, uh, using volunteerism to help support what you're doing. There, there are a range of new tools that I think are really exciting. I mentioned that Chevron's very data driven. We're looking at using more data to make decisions about what we're doing. and. You know, there's so much more data available now that we can access that that's becoming an exciting new opportunity. So I think there's a there's a bright future out, but it, out there, but it's always going to continue to take everyone from all sectors to make it work. It will never be one sided. It will never be all private sector, and it will never be all government. So thank you all for your interest and for continuing to work together as we work out all these challenges um, that we all face every day. Um, thank you, Joanna. Before we let you off the hook, would you mind giving people a sense of the scale of Chevron's contribution to development? Well, our social investment budget uh, on an annual basis globally is about it's about $190 million right now. Um, that covers the range uh, around the world of, of all of the work that we do. Um, and it covers both U.S. domestic activity as well as international activity. That's a really impressive number. Um, so we wanted to have um, plenty of time for questions um, from the audience, um, but before we do, I, I think I'd just like to ask one um, to each of the panelists, kind of following on the, the scale and the commitment to development to put $190 million towards something that um, wouldn't necessarily be a revenue generator. Um, could you talk about a little bit about how your organizations value this development work, why they prioritize it, and um, if you think it's something that is infiltrated throughout the organization or is it coming from the top? We could start with you, Yasmin. Okay, yeah, great. Um, I think as uh, the oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company in the world, we helping patients and helping our communities around us is part of our DNA. So giving back has always been really part of, of the family and our company is still about 70% family owned. Um, and the family still runs the company. So that, that mindset is, is really coming from the top, but also from, from the staff level where all of our country colleagues really want to make a difference in patients' lives and, and by extent, women's lives. So they look at initiatives that we're doing on a global scale and look how they can operationalize them on the ground. So that's, that's something that we have seen as a company um, that it's already part of how we work every day. And we don't necessarily call it international development, but those are that's the effect of it, right? Looking at women, women's economic empowerment and health outcomes is by nature something that helps communities and countries to, to thrive. Well, great. Our Lando Lakes answer is a bit similar to that. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we started as a small uh, cooperative, now a much larger cooperative, but still member owned. Um, you know, every time I talk to some of the board members, so, um, you know, a lot of the board members are actually the dairy farmers, um, they are so excited about what we do in international development and, and they want to keep investing. And so, you know, it's something at the top, but the you know, individual staff are also very excited. And, and really when you, you become a staff of Lando Lakes, you're, you're really acknowledging that you have those same, you know, family values, the, the same values to give back to your community. Um, we recently la launched a program called Ag Abroad and really there's 10,000 employees of, of Lando Lakes and, you know, really only a small handful of them are involved in our international development work. Um, and we really want to get you know, the word out to, to all of the 10,000 employees to give them opportunities to, to give back to international development as well. Um, you know, and anyone that I talk to that has, you know, gone to, to the countries that we work in to, to give back has, has just loved it and wanted to go back. Um, and I expect to see that more in the future. Thank you. I love that ag abroad. Idea. I think using employees uh, and volunteerism as a way to help share what you're doing is really powerful. 
At, um, at Chevron, I think at probably every company, you have to have both high-level support, but then also employee mm -hmm. support, and em employees take a lot of pride in the type of work mm -hmm. that you do. I think um, at Chevron, that it is a large budget. We have a lot of operations all over the world, so it's fairly organic. Each operating area says this is what we need in our community. This is kind of how we want to be engaged or need to be engaged, and that rolls up into one total budget. Um, but but our, our corporate responsibility report just came out this week. If you take a look, our, we have a brand new chairman. He talks about the importance of being in your community and being committed and seeing people thrive. And that's um, you know that's really the business of energy. I think as as the company sees it, and part and parcel of that is is using your your people and your resources to help support your communities where you operate. So there's a very strong commitment. That's great. It's, it, there, we had a much higher budget when commodity prices were higher. <laughs> So it's yeah. the budget fluctuates over time based mm -hmm. on commodities prices and has to be rational with you know the business environment, but it, it still has remained quite strong. That's great, and I'm not sure if I can turn this into a question because I really just want to compliment OPIC. Um, we, when we launched our women's initiative and I presented it to our board, I presented it to an all male board. Um, that's we had one um, female who was rolling off. And part of our initiative is kind of requiring our, our uh, enterprises that we invest in in Honduras to have 30% female representation on their board. So it sort of rung a little hollow um, as I sat there in this sea of maleness. And I, 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 I felt that it would not, um, it just would ring hollow until we turned that mirror on ourselves um, and at OPIC, what we've decided to do is go through something called EDGE certification, which if you're not familiar with that, there's um, LEED certification, which is this internationally recognized um, uh, green building certification you can get. Um, EDGE certification allows an enterprise to go through a process by which they look through all of their policies and their culture and get a certification related to gender equity. Um, it will be the first U.S. government agency to go through this type um, of process. There are several other large global companies that have done so. Um, I highly encourage any enterprise that is interested in better financial performance to take on something like this. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone else on the panel wants to pat themselves on the back. Well, I love to do that. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, I think working on this initiative, Healthy Women, Healthy Economies, and working with our partners in USG and APAC and the Philippines, we realized that that's great, writing some policies, but what about our own policies, right? So we did indeed do that, and we're still working through action plans on how to improve retention among women, working on unbiased conscious training. So there's a lot of research that we're, we've done on the fact that there, women are being passed up by, for promotions in a lot of, in a lot of places, and, um, really looking at working through that and working to improve our policies internally as well. Um, and one of the things that we are also doing is working on flex time, allowing a lot of women tend to have double burden of work and I think men are also feeling that as well. And we're training our, our employees to know what tools they have in order to take that time as well and to use that time um, to be able to balance both life and work. Um, well, maybe I'll continue with the, the gender focus. Um, so I'm a, I'm a part of a group that uh, released a, a gender integration minimum standards of, of uh, a minimum set of things that you should do to be, to be compliant to, to make sure that we're helping both men and women in our projects. Um, and Land O'Lakes International Development signed onto these standards, um, which means that they're you know, going to to try to um, abide by these standards in all of their programming going forward. So I think that's a pretty big um, step in the right direction in terms of gender integration. Do you want to talk about gender? <laughs> I can talk about gender. Sorry to color the. Um, yeah, it was like they both talked about gender. <laughs> no, I think so. I would take a look at it from two sides. On the social side, I think, like I said, we try to be very data driven. So where the data show that um, you know women's health is an issue or women's uh, economic empowerment is an issue, that's what we'll tackle. And then other times it'll be just around small and medium sized enterprises, whoever may own them. Um, so we try to really be focused on the the, the most applicable challenges and solutions. I think as a company, it's a pretty phenomenal 
cultural commitment to equality across the board. Mm -hmm. Very early, early um, commitment by the company to uh, equality along for, for a gay, lesbian, uh, and sort of pride network approach plus women's issues and, and you know, cross-racial approaches so that everyone feels equal, everyone feels part of the culture. We do spend a lot of time on that. And, and you'll see that again in our annual report. This is a significant call out from our chairman who's now redoubled the commitment for equality and for inclusion overall in the company, whoever the person might be. We had actually a little kind of safety moment or cultural moment at a meeting I just came from talking about bias and reducing bias around age discrimination. So we look at it from all angles. That's wonderful. Okay. So great. We would love to take questions from this very informed audience. Um, so there are microphones set up up here. Please um, come on up. Hi, thank you very much. I'm uh, Jeannie Ellis from Cardno, and I love the gender composition of this panel. <laughs> um, we were looking for a token male. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is about the SDGs, right? So we have the sustainable development goals to track progress in international development. But from the private sector, how are you using the SDGs? Is that relevant for you when you're designing social investment programs or when you're developing your monitoring frameworks in your reporting? Do your shareholders care about that? Are we speaking the same language? And if, if not, then how can we in the development community sort of work with you to bridge that gap? Thank you. That's a great question. Do we want to take more than one? Or are we yeah, everyone who wants to respond, please okay. respond. Well, I'll respond. I'm so glad you asked that question because in our new CR report that came out this week, we have our section on the SDGs, which I brought with me. Um, <laughs> So, and this is, and, and I was at a panel discussion earlier this week about what, what, what a company is doing with the SDGs, because it's a little bit hard. And I went through the exercise with Chevron, of, you know, when the SDGs were first coming out to say, how do we even think about this? Because, and it was driven by the head of health, environment, and safety who said, hey, this is interesting because it's combining social and environmental issues. How do we think about it? We actually did a full assessment of all of the goals and the um, sub-goals and tried to figure out where do we have the biggest impact and where should we really focus. And from that, in the beginning, we picked out sort of three to four goals where we really felt like we had something to say. Um, but interestingly, again, our new chairman came in and said, hey, we are involved in every one of these goals. How do we think about this more holistically? And so we, we pulled out, we you know, sort of added to the number of goals we highlighted in our CR report this time and how we're talking about them. And, and now we're in the process of saying, okay, how should we be thinking about this? It's probably too much to think about all 17 goals per company, but thinking about what does that mean to identify the ones that are most important to you, to think about what you are doing or could be doing in pursuit of those goals, how to talk about that. That's all, I think, um, something that's going to progress over time because it's a really big set of, of issues, but I think taking it piece by piece has been helpful for us. That's a great answer. If anyone else wants to chime in, that's perfect, but otherwise if the questioner could direct their, if they do would like someone to address it specifically, please go ahead and otherwise whoever wants to just raise their hand. And I'll just add to that, as a healthcare company, health is a big uh, topic of the SDGs and, and looking at NCDs as well. So the work that we're doing naturally lends itself to international development and the sustainable goals. So we don't have that difficulty of speaking that language. I think we already do just by, by, by nature of wanting to uh, provide um, solutions for patients. And I would say the same for Land O'Lakes with, you know, hunger, um, you know, feeding human progress being our, our mission um, across the organization. And, and they do a lot of research in trying to get more for less, um, trying to, to make our fields more uh, productive so that we can feed, um, you know, the growing number of people in the world. Well, thank you. Um, my question is actually not specific. It's for anyone who wants to answer. And being involved in a lot of past PPP, private sector, public sector conversations, a lot of the discussions always end up with there's so much investment and not enough bankable projects in different pipelines. So my question for you is really how do you approach building your pipelines and figuring out the feasibility of what projects you are specifically going to go after? I think it's listening to our partners. I, that seems obvious and intuitive, but I think sometimes 
knowing what works for that local context really helps shape a PPP and make it effective and really knowing the roles and responsibilities and the results that a PPP uh, wants to achieve and, and making that clear and making that um, achievable achievable goals not necessarily something pie in the sky but really make it um, tangible and achievable to the communities um, is, is helpful in my in my experience I'll comment on that quickly. Um, so at OPIC, um, we're a demand-driven organization, so our pipeline is um, driven by those that apply. And the truth is, um, with respect, they do need to be bankable projects, right, by the time they get investment um, from OPIC. I think the challenge is that there are a lot of really good projects that don't have that development capital. That, for, that capital that gets them from this is needed, this is a good idea, to this is a bankable project. Um, so um, as Joanna was mentioning, you know, there's a new world out there of innovative financing and blended, blended financing. And if we can get some of this um, early stage, high risk, grant-like capital uh, toward uh, really important projects that do have a high development um, outcome but also are bankable, I think that we would see a lot more flowing through pipelines like OPICs. Hi, thanks very much for being here. Um, my name's Tracy Mitchell with DAI, and I'm sure you're all aware that USAID has started talking more about enterprise-led development and how to incorporate enterprise-led development into our overall development approach. And I think this is personally beyond um, public-private partnership. It's really how to engage um, private sector companies, both in the countries we work in, as well as international companies in the work we're doing. So I'm interested in your perspective, um, as since you've been doing this and most of your private sector companies, um, if you have any lessons learned or advice or guidance for what you really think is the potential for enterprise-led development, my impression at this point is that it's, um, it hasn't been a totally thought out idea. And so um, as many of us are trying to think of um, what is the real potential there and how we should be doing that, I'd be interested in your perspectives. Thank you. It's a good question. Any volunteers? I mean, I think we see the field going to to market systems. Um, the I mean, it's a it's a difficult thing, but ultimately, private companies that have you know a a reason to invest, a reason, a, a monetary reason, really, um, to invest in new jobs, to invest in, in development of um, other countries, are sort of the, the most sustainable way to do development work. And, and we see a lot of uh, USA missions coming out with projects that want to see that um, enterprise-led um, enterprise-led approach. Um, I mean, Lando Lakes International Development has been going more and more in that direction, and, and just based on our knowledge from the corporation of, of how they work and how they invest, it's, it's very helpful to understand how we can work with these private sector firms to buy down their risk, whether it be through, you know, a matching grant through, or a matching loan through OPIC or um, another mechanism. but. I mean, I don't think private sector necessarily has, is the magic answer, um, but I understand why, um, you know, why it makes sense for sustainability reasons. Companies are going to stay in a, um, are going to continue doing the development that they do if it improves their bottom line in general. So I don't know. I mean, it's a hard question. I'm new, so I'm, I hope this is all off the record. Um, I hope I don't say something incorrect, which I usually do. So I, I guess I would just comment that um, the way I have always viewed the spectrum of development, there is real need for um, grant aid. Like, there is just real need for that in the world. And then it's a continuum. And the goal is to bring people along that continuum to a place where there, there is a, the possibility of investment and private sector growth. Um, so I, I guess I would say 
wow, I hope we aren't really getting away from this grant aid um, sustain, like this getting to a, just a, a base <laughs> where, where enterprise-led development is even possible. Mm. Um, I, I know I view uh, USAID as absolutely critical and in the most um, ideal world, their hard work over years and years leads to a place where OPIC can come in and provide that private sector growth and incentive. Um, so, okay. Any, um, any other questions? Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is for Joanna. I would just like to uh, hear an example maybe of one of your favorite uh, projects or I'm just curious how some of this uh, $190 million is being used uh, just from a pro programmatic perspective. Um, if you could give us an example and also if you could maybe any of any of you ladies could um, tell us about your strategy as far as participating with uh, local communities and how you target some of your funds. How do you uh, build those relationships with communities? Thank you. Okay, what's, where, who are you and where are you from? Oh, my name is Morgan Burns and I work for EcoDit. Okay. Um, so giving you an example. So I, I think I, I feel like, to give you a little background, when I came to Chevron almost five years ago, I came to work on international development issues and I got to the company and I started looking around and I was like, oh my gosh, this is a really changing portfolio of companies. Chevron is increasingly either a developed or rising middle income country portfolio. And so looking at how we do things, it's, it's a little bit different around the world. It's gonna look different in different places and I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about what we're doing in the United States um, where we do a lot around STEM education, um, programming to, to promote STEM education, mentoring, working with young women in STEM. That's been a big part, but that stems from sort of our, our approach to doing everything, which is we generally have people in the communities or who are from the communities working for the company and listening to what people need. Um, so an example, let me think. So one example that it's, it's fairly easy to give is the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative is probably one of the biggest partnerships and programs in Chevron's history. Um, it was, it grew out of a real business need to calm down and stabilize the situation in, in one of our operational areas. We embarked on a major commitment with USAID and have worked on a range of issues. What we did, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it, it's a very complex process, but we ended up establishing two organizations. So we have in Nigeria an organization that's located in the capital close to USAID, close to the capital that runs the programming for the organization. They have field offices in two of the operational areas where Chevron operates, and those are the people who go and do programming. They have programming on peace building, which is a really significant part of what they do. They have peace building networks. They talk to each other. They spend time um, dealing with sort of conflict resolution related issues. They have a markets program. DAI has been a major partner. Um, we, we have value, you know, market value chains. We spent a lot of time collecting data to, to decide where to focus. So the, the focus areas have been cassava, aquaculture, palm oil, and one other that I'm forgetting. Um, but so they've worked to help, so we, we built fish ponds, we built sort of a technology center, sort of an experimentation center, and a sort of a hub for staff and for community meetings. They've worked with farmers to teach better feeding technologies, better feeding processes, all this stuff. Chevron has really not a lot of knowledge about agriculture, but we spend a lot of time doing it in a lot of countries. <laughs> so a lot of the stuff that you do, you know, we have people who are ag specialists who are aquaculture, um, you know, feeding science specialists who work with farmers to help what they're trying to do fundamentally across the board from, from the ag programs to the peace building programs. Uh, is, is to build capacity to build buy-in and input of a really wide web of people around the entire region where Chevron operates to help, you know, to help stabilize the economy and stabilize the situation. Um, what, what we did in order to complement that was to have more of a policy approach too. So there's policy work done in Nigeria, but we also have a 501c3 arm that's located here in Washington, just down the street. And they manage the, the grant process with the USAID. They manage the, the finances to make sure that everything runs properly through the process. They manage um, outreach and engagements. They, they, one of their goals over the course of this whole process was to talk about the Niger Delta as a place where you could actually invest. 
And so that's what they've really spent a lot of time about. It's like, we're open for business. You can do stuff in this region. So that's kind of a long answer, but that's one of our, our big, big, big programs. Any one of those components you might find somewhere around the, the, the world. There, we have environmental programs in the Gulf of Mexico. We have a lot of, um, you know, birding, nature center programs. That's been a hallmark of what we do in the Gulf of Mexico. So, but, but the, the health and community engagements are, are worldwide. They'll, they'll just have a little bit different flavor depending on where it is, but that process, the participatory process is largely similar. More than you wanted to know, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Michael Manansal. I'm from FHI 360. Um, and my question is a variation of a question asked earlier um, in the morning uh, keynote around uh, time horizons, and uh, particularly around two buckets. Uh, Meredith, you mentioned earlier um, that the private sector will keep doing the development work that they do um, as long as it, it you know, matches and, and uh, matches their bottom line, aligns with their bottom line. Um, but there's two buckets that I'm, I'm also looking at here. There's a, there's a financial um, time horizon and then there's a social um, time horizon, uh, social bottom line and financial bottom line. And those two things sometimes go together and sometimes they're at odds with each other. Um, and in some organizations, the social bottom line is more important and in others, um, it's the financial bottom line. But then we're working in the same space trying to advance um, a similar mission. Um, how have you, if, if, if you've encountered this, how have you um, navigated that tension um, when working uh, internally with your stakeholders, but also externally with your partners? I'll let you guys go. I think there's two in the room. Oh, oh okay. Um, I mean, Land Lakes is very unique because um, we have Land Lakes International Development as a nonprofit, and we get mostly U.S. government funding to implement projects. So we don't necessarily have that problem with uh, the bottom line being affected by the development work that we do. Um, obviously, you know, we get some support from the the corporation, but. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question for that reason. I mean, for um, in terms of uh, staff time or or um, investments made by the corporation that might a affect their bottom line, I think given the the mission of the organization and and our values, I don't think people see it as a trade off. They see it as um, as doing something that makes them feel good, um, and whether you know, and, and the organization is just very committed to, um, to supporting both domestically and internationally. So um, while Land Lakes International Development is not our corporate and social responsibility wing, we do have one that focuses domestically on uh, the communities really surrounding um, the areas that we work in. So we, we're you know, an organization that works across the countries in many, di in, in many different states. Um, and so they focus on education, on obviously um, hunger and, and working with uh, food banks um, in the communities around the areas where they're in. So, you know, I guess I, ha I haven't seen that trade-off um, at Land O'Lakes. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Logan with Commonix and also the chair of Sid Washington. So thank you all very much for being here today. My question is, um, I've heard a little bit about CSR and volunteerism, and I'm wondering if you can talk about, um, in a very business sense, how you look at supply chain sustainability, backwards through your supply chain, and how you achieve really positive development outcomes, because it's critical to your bottom line. It's critical to have a sustainable supply chain all the way back to where you're sourcing your raw materials, and you need to have healthy, um, you need to have healthy, um, uh, employees or villagers who are working there, they need to be educated, they need to have their basic needs met. So to what extent are you looking at it from just a pure business perspective at supply chain sustainability and then linking that um, to positive development outcomes? Do you want to start asking? Sure. Um, I think to, to link it explicitly that way, we, we're not really doing per se, but I think we're, we're looking at it um, specifically in a lot, a lot of our projects. We see that there is a need. 
right, in the community. For example, in, in a lot of devel developing contexts, they don't have enough oncologists in one country. I mean, one country can have 20 in a, in, you know, a, a country of 10 million. So that's, that's a small number. And, and what we see is that the whole health system, at least as a healthcare company, needs to be strengthened. And we work in, in different ways to create capacity, to create uh, better um, facilities through working with our partners, through working with global partners to, to ensure that. So I, I don't think we think of it as a supply chain per se, but it's more of, it's, it's an environment of, of, of healthcare and healthcare sustainability that, uh, that uh, we work in in different projects, at least at our company. I mean, Land O'Lakes is, is a bit different because our organization is owned by our supply chain. Um, <laughs> So I am very interested to see, you know, we've just made investments in Africa. I'm very interested to see what's going to happen there. Um, and so, you know, more to come on that. I mean, the supply chain area has just exploded in terms of its importance and relevance on the, just sort of the broad responsibility side. So um, this is an area where Chevron has, has been, is there's been a, a downturn in the industry. It's been very crunched on the supply chain side, but now we're starting to say, okay, we need to think very strategically about you know, how we're managing this. And, and again, you can never, ever compromise safety and quality. So looking, you know, trying to figure out those areas where you can, can look at your supply chain for different goals is something that t really takes leadership from within the business to say, we're willing to do this. And then partnership, you know, potentially maybe with the, the corporate responsibility folks to say, let's invest, let's invest in broadening out our supply chain. Chevron's done this in a limited way in a couple places. Uh, one community around a refinery where we had to kind of sit and map out who are all our suppliers. Well, we could buy coffee locally. We could do catering locally, but it takes more, the supply chain folks just have to operate at such a large scale. It takes people who are willing to go out in the community and foster and build those relationships to bring in some of those smaller suppliers. So it's very time and people intensive. It's, a, it's, a, it's an area that I think is gonna continue to gain interest and focus, but we're still early days, I think, within most companies. Um, supply chains are a pretty complex part of the business. Thank you, I think this will be the last question. Thank you so much. Well, mine can be short because uh, Christine, the one who went before me, was asked almost the same question. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just gonna build on what she said. Um, I'm Peter Boone, I work with Palladium, and we do a lot of um, work in sustainable supply chains, and we look at them very often for the, for the long-term impact. And um, as we see this evolution of public-private partnerships and companies like yours that are looking at um, long-term impact, we have observed, you know, kind of from a distance that some of the CSR projects are kind of short term in duration and not as sustainable as actually integrating suppliers into your supply chain. So from our perspective, we have seen that it, it may take a lot of work, as <coughs> Johanna said, that um, you know, adjusting your global or regional procurement policies to, um, to put a lot more time into, you know, evaluating local suppliers in yeah. Kazakhstan mm -hmm. or Nigeria or whatever, but to the extent possible that you can actually start to think of your CSR and your, your genuine business uh, interests and align them, and it might not write up just exactly the same way in the annual reports and things, but it, it probably is gonna have a lot more impact and there could be bigger win-wins and keep you in some of those countries for, for longer. So that's my point, it was probably more of a I don't even know if there's a question there, but maybe you can come <laughs> That's a great point, and if anyone would like to respond. Oh, that's a great point, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, so as promised, it was the most entertaining and informative panel of the day. Please thank our panelists. <laughs>